Did you get, Did you that? get that? Did you get that? Did you get that? Welcome to Mission Forward. Hi there, and welcome to the Mission Forward podcast, where each week we bring you a thought-provoking and perspective-shifting conversation on the power of communication. I'm Carrie Fox, your host and CEO of Mission Partners, a social impact communications firm and certified B Corporation. And today I'm starting with a little story. So when my daughters were in preschool and early elementary school, one of our favorite shows was Word Girl. It's this great little PBS show where the super heroine, and I love that they call her a super heroine, Word Girl flies to the rescue when there's trouble in the city. And as you might guess, Word Girl uses her kick butt vocabulary to defeat the outlaws. I loved these happy little afternoons with my little girls. I loved that show, and it is not too much of a stretch to say that I miss Word Girl. I wish my kids hadn't outgrown that show, and I thought my vocabulary superhero was gone for good until I came across today's guests. Kathy and Ross Tetris are like Word Girl and Word Guy for grownups. And their NPR show, You're Saying It Wrong, has become our family's go-to podcast on Family Drives. So if you are not familiar with their show or their books or their writing, we are going to change that today. Catherine and Ross Petrus are the New York Times bestselling authors of You're Saying It Wrong, That Doesn't Mean What You Think It Means, and Awkward Moments, along with numerous other books. They also, as mentioned, co-host an award-winning NPR podcast called You're Saying It Wrong about word histories, language controversies, grammar, and all things word-related. And today, I'm pretty lucky that they are here with us. Kathy and Ross, welcome to Mission Forward. Oh, this is going to be great. And I want to call myself Word Girl from now on. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should be called Word Siblings or Word Sis. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Do I have to wear spandex? <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> so you two have to tell me, how in the world did you land such a fun career as authors and NPR podcasts hosts? You, you all seem to do a little bit of everything. How did you land in this great career? Well, it's funny. Um, I started out as a uh, foreign service officer in the State Department, and Kathy was in TV news. And in uh, and I think it was overseas, and I this was before the internet. I got tired of I just kept reading and reading, and I finally got into. I'd read everything, so I started reading romance novels in um, <laughs> from Harlequin, and I thought, "Gee, we could probably do better if Kathy and I teamed up." Mm -hmm. So, from Saudi Arabia, from the embassy in Saudi Arabia, I remember I sent Kathy a letter and said, "Why don't we get together and write romance novels? And I'll put, I'll provide the international stuff, and you provide the love." <laughs> and Kathy. Well, we did. <laughs> and we're not going to tell you what the pseudonym was. <laughs> that was then. Thank you. So we started out with that and we just had, we ended up going into nonfiction pretty quickly. And, yeah, we did. Um, we did a couple on a pseudonym, but it just got sort of tiring and we wanted it to wasn't do it. Us. It really wasn't us. Yeah. So I'm going to say. If my brother called me and said, hey, Kara, let's write a romance novel, I'd say, you are you are trying to pull my chain again. You are trying to, to trick me into something. Did you believe him? You knew he was serious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ross, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, though, I think I should interject and say we were we lived overseas when we were little kids. So I think that he and I were very close. We were, mm -hmm. were used to working together. Um, we used to write like horrible plays together. And yeah, we used to do plays. parents had to watch I know. Them. Over we and over. They were, brilliant. Yeah. They were so, very bad I mean, plays. Yeah. Yes, they were. But so I, I, I think that a lot of it is we were always kind of like a team, which sounds corny, but it's true. So it was not a, a leap to go from like brother and sister friendly team to brother and sister working team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we were both were always writing, even in our earlier jobs. I mean, I was doing mostly writing in the State Department. Mm -hmm. and Kathy was doing, you know, uh, writing for the uh, TV, you know, news. TV news. Mm -hmm. So it was an easy mix anyway. We were already writing. So it was easy right. to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, move in together to do it. I have heard you on the podcast talk a bit about your dad says this. And earlier you were saying your mom said it this way. How much of an influence did they have 
in your love of words? A lot. There's no question. Both of our parents were avid readers. I mean, we were one thing when we were kids, we would get like boxes of books. I mean, it was like the average present always entailed books were somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. And um, like we were saying earlier, mom, which dovetails to what we're doing now with the word stuff, the word nerd stuff, as we call it. Um, our mother was a stickler. I mean, she she wasn't like a, a like a jerk about it, <laughs> I mean, but she spoke properly and she was like very aware of it. And she always corrected us if we did something wrong. She wasn't like one of those people you go, oh, really judgy, judgy, mm-hmm. but, but, but she was but, aware of it. But I do think we're more liberal than our mom. I, I think that having been writing for so many years, I think we've gotten a little more tolerant of quote unquote errors. We, we kind of wonder like, what is an error? Mm. I think we're really big on clarity more than anything else. Mm. I think that's perfect. That's exactly it. You're right. You're right. Because our big thing is language is about communication. It's not necessarily about correctness. Mm -hmm. You just want to express yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You also don't want to be a nervous wreck trying to like correct every, you know, dot every. Yeah, uh, really. Right. Right. And we talk about this a lot on this show that sometimes that limits a leader's ability to say something because they're so worried they're going to say it wrong, either in literally the words they're using or in the context of their words that they're using. And and it does feel like you let all that go and instead just say, let's explore this and let's learn about it and, and have some fun in the process. Except, and let's calm down, like you right. just said, because it's true. If you're sitting there going like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what am I saying? What, you're going you're gonna to blow it. You just don't. Right. You know right. it and I know it. Mm-hmm. So there's more to words here. You bring some, some really meaty psychology background to this too, in terms of how people speak and uh, confidence builders. Tell me a little more about your background. So I'm thinking about all of the CNBC articles that you write. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, oh, what? Well, we actually, <laughs> it's funny because when we started out writing, we didn't really have that much money. So we also realized that we were also really good at getting jobs and interviewing. We're not very good at keeping the job because we get no. bored. Well, we, we could have kept them. We just got bored. Yeah. <laughs> and so like, we like, actually oh. also began to talk about interviews and what like works in terms of interviewing. And that was a really interesting aspect, I think, of our lives because a couple of times we got jobs that we really shouldn't have gotten because we didn't have the qualifications. But we had the kind of talkativeness mm. or gabbiness that got us the job. And that interested us, I think, in many ways for, throughout the years. But having said that, we both are real other sticklers as authenticity. It's much better to look for a job and to speak with people who speak as not, I'm not going to say culture fit because that's a loaded term. But what I'm really saying is that it you tend to do really well. And I found this out years ago when you do something that really fits with you. My dad loved, wanted me to become a banker. I remember. And I am like the antithesis of banking, absolute antithesis. (laughs) And I went and I I really couldn't get at first. I went to all these interviews and dad's going, you got to say this, say that. It didn't work. I did not get a job. Then I approached. I was really interested in foreign affairs. I approached directly outside of HR uh, CEO or a, a senior vice president of a bank. We talked and we got to talking about foreign affairs and he hired me against the wishes of the of hr mm. and that's where i think the key really is to be able to communicate well with people who you like and you want to like mm-hmm. and i think i know i mean so much out there right now is with coded words with loaded words as ross said i i think that um nowadays words are much more important in a weird way than they used to be i think yes context a context and b history i guess behind them or what the unsaid meaning right. you know and i and i think that we have to on one hand like what you were saying before you know you can't get up there and panic but i think you have to think i think you have to be aware of 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 where the word came from and right. what it might mean to someone right. else right well it's, it's almost like an empathy thing when you're speaking yes. nowadays, i think yes I'm curious. So to that point, there are so many words that we've heard uh, say, well, consider the the in- the intention behind using a word like master, for instance, master bedroom, master brand, find another way to say primary bedroom or primary brand because of what what a word originally meant. 
How much do you see in, in the work that you do coming through of wanting to sunset certain words or saying, maybe we don't have to over-engineer this so much? This is, this is really interesting because I, prior to the uh, podcast, I looked up some of, your, some of your articles and you mentioned maybe we should sunset the word competitive. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm, I, I deal a lot with the University of Toronto with the library and I actually went around and talked to about, I think it was about 15 women who work there and 15 men or 10 men who work there. It was fascinating. Every, every single woman I talked to said competitive implies male. Mm. implies masculine they don't want to go to work they don't want a job in a quote competitive environment most men including me until i read the article thought <laughs> yeah, competitive it's fine <laughs> Which, i mean i don't want to overdo gender differences but it was a really interesting dichotomy mm. and i began by thinking well maybe we should just sort of like you know leave competitive in there i ended up saying challenging or <laughs> collaborative environment and i think i would, I would go for it instead so I do think that words are definitely loaded. I think we have to be aware that sometimes we don't know what's loaded. We have to listen, I think, a lot more than we do. But I got to interject now. The but on the other hand, I which saw is, that look in your so face, Kathy. At. I saw that. I knew you were coming. I at. Couldn't help. I don't like words. Yeah. <laughs> on the other hand, what drives me a little bonko sometimes is I see things and they're wrong. Like I saw some uh, incorrect backstories now about about phrases or words that don't oh, yeah. apply like rule of thumb i don't know how many times i've seen someone share on facebook on on x now mm-hmm. or whatever um that rule of thumb it was about like you could beat a woman with a with a, a stick that it's not the case at all that's that's not true rule of thumb did not come from that it's it's a fine fine saying so I think that there is a little too much sometimes. So mm-hmm. again, I think it's what Ross is saying. It's like, we, I think we have to weigh and judge and think. I, right. I think it's just that. Be aware. Right, right, right. And it comes back, right, to that empathy of how will people receive it and, and understanding as much as we can around the background of it. I love that. Thank you. All right. So I want to talk about pronunciation a bit because a, another quick little anecdote before we start. Uh, this weekend, my husband and I watched Rustin. Have you seen Rustin yet? Just came out this past weekend. Okay, so it's the new movie about Bayard Rustin. And so for folks who don't know, civil rights leader, peace activist, he served as a special assistant to Martin Luther King Jr. He helped organize the 1963 March on Washington. There are a lot of reasons why we wanted to watch this movie, including the fact that there is a school just down the street from us that is located, that is named after him. And for years, I have been saying, Bayard Rustin. Turns out I've been saying it wrong. It's Bayard Rustin. So as we think about all the kids that go to that school who now have to re-engineer how they say uh, Bayard Rustin. But it made me think, right, there is so much that we say wrong, that we mispronounce in the English language, that we mangle in the English language. And it sounds like you've had some fun. You wrote a whole book about this. You have a podcast about this. What are some of those words that we mispronounce most often in the English language? I'm going to start with the one. It's not commonly used, but the one that spawned the book, because Ross and I mispronounced it all the time, which is the word detritus, yes. which we always went around happily going detritus. Look at all that detritus on the beach. And we learned that for most of our adult life, we had been saying it wrong, which is mm. why we wrote the book, actually. Mm. And here's another embarrassing one, Q-U-A-Y. I, I mean, this really embarrasses me because, you know, they're, they're, I always pronounced it as quay. It's mm-hmm. not, it's key. And that is egregiously mispronounced by many, many people. And it, what really interests us the most doing the book is that almost everyone you know will mispronounce one or two words mm-hmm. uh, of the common words. And that was one of mine. Mm. I got to say, I still think Quay, though, too. I really right. do. I like Quay better. I like yeah, I, I can't help it. I look at it and I don't I don't yeah. think he. I really mm, don't. Mm, yeah. mm. The other one that I hear all the time is the word tenet, T-E-N-E-T. And uh, not everybody, but so many people say tenant, as in the tenant of apartment building. Mm. It's tenet. But I think no your brain immediately wants to throw in the end. It's, it's just, it mm. doesn't seem 
right, oddly mm-hmm. enough. And that's one thing Ross and I have found often is that a lot of mispronunciations are because the 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 way the word is spelled or whatever is is not the norm. And your brain helpfully screws mm-hmm. up and mm-hmm. tries to make it the what you think sounds right and it's wrong. But in your head you're going, well, it should be this. Mm-hmm. Which leads to the problem sometimes that people pronounce something and then they write it incorrectly. And again, I'm, we're, neither of us are real sticklers on this, but one of my real pet peeves, and I, I always say should have, I should have done this, I should have done that. But then I see written out should of, O-F. Yeah, that drives me nuts. Is, which is wrong. And I think that's one where I'm going to stick my, I, I don't think you should write that at all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In terms of sales of Ross, this one drives me crazy because my husband actually says this sometimes. And I'm Don't just like, tell me. I, know it. I know it. Yeah. It's mischievous. And he says mischievous. And I just go like, no, there's nothing on there. It just makes me want to cry. What were you thinking? I was thinking of the other one that we used to go to a, uh, this isn't a big deal, but we used to go to an Italian restaurant a lot when Kathy and I lived in New York. Mm-hmm. And we would order uh, what we said was bruschetta which is that sort of uh, Italian pizza-like mm-hmm, thing. And mm-hmm. it's bruschetta with the cu mm-hmm. sound. And that's, a t- that's the one problem English has, which most languages really don't. English is such an amalgam of languages that we get all these foreign terms in there. And then we blithely either mispronounce them or mangle them. Right. Eventually, the mangled term usually takes charge. Right. Well, I would bet that bruschetta is going to become bruschetta, not bruschetta. All right. How about, is it gif or is it jif? That one, we got a lot of heat on. Everybody says gif, as do we. However, we did say in the book that the guy who designed, who started it all out, said it was jif. Mm. He was a jif boy. Mm. And I think he's the one who invented them, for heaven's sake. So I guess we should listen. But All no, right. I don't think we should. I think okay. everyone should just say GIF. <laughs> it just sounds oh. better the other way. Oh, can I say that uh, Quay, though, you asked about Quay mm-hmm. Key. It used to be Cook Key. And then the French, the French, English likes, it likes getting words from Latin and French because it looks more prestigious. It looks mm-hmm. better. So we took the, it would pronounced Key, but we took the French pronunciation, which is Q-U-A-I, which is where I should have known it because... In, in diplomacy, Quai d'Orsay is the uh, seat of the French uh, diplomatic service. Mm. But we took that Q-U-A-I from the French and then was called a spelling pronunciation. I looked at that and I said, oh, it's Quay, you know, that sort of thing. I don't know how you do anything other than just research words all day. There's so much to learn. <laughs> all right. Um, nuclear, nuclear, I understand, is one of the most mispronounced. Is that right? People get tripped up on it. Nuclear. Uh, well, especially when in the days of George W., forget it. I mean, like you, right. how, you could not hear that. The other one that we hear a lot is um, we call it the magic E, the words that end with an E, and they're usually from the Greek, like hyperbole. And again, Ross was saying spelling pronunciation. People see it and think it's hyperbole, mm. but they know the word hyperbole, right. but they don't like they it, it doesn't jibe. It's like right. this is one word. This is another word. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? This is like a PSA for reading, right? The more we read and see those words, probably the more sense it makes. But yeah, right. <laughs> Although segue always comes. Thank you. The segue, you see the word S E G U E, and you don't think segue, do no. you? I wouldn't. I mean, I know it, but I mean, I don't think you automatically think that's segue. You just said one that drives me up the wall, too. You said jibe, which is correct. That doesn't jibe with that. I don't yeah. like it when people say that doesn't jive with that, which is a different word, the V instead of the B. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm going to pick out two of my favorites from your book that doesn't mean what you think it means, because these are things I have problems with all the time. And I see in many of our of our clients uh, when they are writing. And the first one is impact. And I often see it perhaps confused or used with um, effect and affect. And somehow impact gets wrapped up in there too. But this is page 95 of your book. When you talk about impact, there's a quote from Bill Clinton. And he says, you have to see the connection between what we do and what it impacts on us and how it impacts around the world. So I ask you to support that. 
impact. Seems like a lot of folks have a hard time with this one. Yeah, I, it's it's one. It's so funny because remember years ago when impacts first started becoming a verb, it was mm-hmm. used to be a mainly a noun. It was like there is an impact, and that was this impacts. And I was one of those people who didn't like it, but I, I've admitted defeat, and it's being used impacts on us and how how Bill Clinton said it, I think it's just horrible. I'm sorry. I think it's so clunky. It's it's just like, why do this? I mean, as we said in the book, why can't you say how it affects us? There's so many other words you can use in this case, but we're wedded to those kind of words. Like impact sounds sort of like, I was going to say like, like businessy. It sounds important. It's like mm-hmm. it's impact. But, but I'm going to, I'm going to interject here. And this is where it's fun working with the sibling because we can argue about it as well. We did write it and we did write how to correctly say it and how not to say it. But that again, then again, we're saying basically we're talking about what's called a transitive verb where it directly affects the noun. You don't need an on or an in or anything like that. And then we're talking about an intransitive where you need an on or an in. Classically, it impacts, you don't need to say on, classically. Mm-hmm increasingly and we've we've talked about this earlier i think before the show words are changing language is changing Mm -hmm. so i mean i think kathy is right it sounds uglier for us to say impacts on but it would not be generally considered incorrect nowadays and i think bill clinton the point though is for us i this is where i'm going to disagree with you now as your sibling i mean i know you're right it's technically fine but it sounds ugly and if you can if you can say something more gracefully why not i think Mm -hmm. kathy has summed it up perfectly just there as a sibling (laughs) no i think she has i think we can argue that it could be generally accepted but it sounds a lot it it sounds a lot more elegant the other way and why not be more elegant i agree right okay effect affect Folks have that's a hard a big, time with this one. That's a biggie. Yeah. That's a biggie. And I think that needs to be basically, uh, uh, we need to distinguish between the two. Mm-hmm. But I mean, well, the problem with effect and affect is they kind of overlap a little bit. So that's where you're going to get into a problem. This affects me. Then if I want to effect someone, that means I'm doing it. I'm going to effect a change And I'm going to change how it affects me. That would be the best way to sum it up. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is... I'll wait for Kathy to disagree, so... (laughs) Oh, I heard her agree. (laughs) You did? Okay. (laughs) That I'll I'll often see people, uh, me included, try to solve this one by just switching the word. Saying, well, instead of effects me or the, 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 uh, the effect of this, impact gets dropped in there instead the impact on us or whatever it is that the interchangeability i'm not sure that we're supposed to but the interchangeability of those words well that's actually the one thing i think more people should do i'm a, I'm a big believer in that if you're not sure switch it out i i still have trouble sometimes with the i and the me i overcorrect myself when because i think so many people think i is correct when it really should be me but i we've got it drummed in our heads that it should be I and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And I'm one of those people who says myself a lot in that mm-hmm. case. Because it's like, mm-hmm. I'm not sure, quick, make the change. Don't right. notice, you know? That would be technically an incorrect use of myself, though, actually, Kathy. In which case? Um, that had a big impact on myself. No, on me. I wasn't saying there. Okay. Oh, I thought you were substituting impact. No, I was okay. I was saying globally that sometimes substitution is a good idea when you're panicky mm-hmm. and you find a safe a, a safe way to get out of the morass of of possible problems. Right. Okay. That's good. Okay. Is it in regard to, in regards to, or with regard to? It's in regard, not regards to. You don't, you can send your regards in regard to that wonderful person you met yesterday. But with regard to is something else. Yes. With regard, with regard to what I saw yesterday, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Right. So are in regard to and with regard to interchangeable? Um, They can be with regard to and in regard to, yeah, they can. They're very interchangeable. The key thing is, you know, plural, you don't make a plural out of it. Mm-hmm. With regard to and in regard to can both be 
use normally. I don't, I use with regard to or in regard to, and I don't particularly like it. I will say like, you know, in regard to your statement of yesterday, in regard to that letter, but I'm not wild about it, but you should never put the plural in. Otherwise you can use both you know, interchangeably. I, I tend to think you'd be better off saying about. Mm, there we go. Even simpler. Yes. There we go. Just find it. Find a different option. So there is no shortage of content that you could write about and learn about. And you have done so well in so many of your books. How do you decide? You talked earlier about uh, coming across that one word and, and it spawned your, your earlier book. How do you decide where to put your energy when you're writing a book? That's a toughie. I think to, I mean, I think it's incredibly unscientific on one level where it's stuff that Ross and I are aware of or that bothers us or that we've been told by others bother them on one level. And what else are, do you think? There are surveys too, you know, the most mispronounced words of, you know, whatever, 2023 or whatever, most misused words. You can look at those as well. But the one interesting thing about language is it rapidly changes. Mm -hmm. So you're taking snapshots of misused words. Things will go overnight, will change. So Kat, like Kat said, a lot of it's unscientific. We hear it a lot and we decide to put it in. Mm -hmm. What are you working on now? We're actually working on a book. We're just completing it right now, which is a history. It's, a, it's a outside of uh, words. It's a history of psychoactive uh, drug use, anything from coffee to opium in history. <laughs> so, so sorry. It's a history of the world through mind altering drugs. Wow. Have you talked to yeah. Michael Pollan yet? <laughs> we should, should we? it's we completely should. off the wall this was just something it was like a break book for us i mean it so it's been a this was just fun you know it was just something to do that was completely different that because we are slightly polymaths for austin eyes yeah oh that's very cool i'm actually reading his book right now this is your mind on plants and he talks about caffeine and opium and everything you've just mentioned oh that's so fun Okay, I had mentioned to you, and I'll reinforce to folks listening, this show is going to drop right around the holidays, and I highly recommend getting anyone that you love uh, or care about in any way one of Ross and Kathy's books, because they are so much fun. They are just delightful little guides, and um, as noted, listen to their podcast too. So um, as we're wrapping up, Kathy, Ross, anything else you want to share with us or anything you want to leave us with today? I think for me, I just want to say like, language is fun. And I think we worry so much about it, we lose that. But there's, it's wonderful to find the right word at the right moment and communicate. That's what mm. it's all about. So just calm down, keep talking, it's all good. I like that, keep talking. I think that's Kathy's <laughs> my, my motto right there. <laughs> both, of our, both of our spouses say, what do you guys talk about all the time? We yeah, never stop true. talking. <laughs> Therefore, we like words for that reason. How else can we do it? That's fantastic. Well, you keep talking. I'll keep listening. And uh, we'll see you next time on Mission Forward. Thanks so much. Hey, all before we wrap today, I want to leave you with one more thing. I've been doing this communications work for more than 20 years now, and I have worked with and learned from hundreds of purpose driven professionals. A few years back, I started to reflect on what they all have in common. And what I can tell you is that the most effective social impact leaders all share a set of essential characteristics. They lead with care, courage, and clarity, even in the most complex of times. My new book, More Than Words, Communications Practices of Courageous Leaders, is designed to help you build your skills as a communicator, and it can help you realize your power as a social impact leader. Whether you're trying to drive an organization to more equitable outcomes, or you're thinking about the role you individually play on a team, this book can be your guide. So grab your copy today at missionforward.us backslash more than words or wherever you buy books. And thanks. <laughs>